Hello students. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending when you're watching this. We are now going to be diving into the next section of module three, which is identifying with a deviant label. Look, I'm on our name badge. So <laughs> let us jump into this conversation and uh, we'll kind of get going down this process, right? So the reality is, is that many people break norms and therefore engage in deviance, but not everyone is labeled as deviant because of their behavior. Let's examine how a person develops a deviant identity once he or she or they is labeled, all right? So going from here, it becomes really important for us to understand that as people gain that label, right, we'll also look at the accounts they use to neutralize or normalize deviance, right? The Adlers identify seven stages of the deviant identity career. That is a person shedding his or her or their innocent identity for a deviant one. <clears throat> First, the person is caught and publicly identified. Next, people change their attitudes towards him, her, or them, and use retrospective interpretation, where they think of a person's past behaviors and reframe them in a different light. Thirdly, he, she, or they is given a spoiled identity, a tarnished reputation. Fourth, he, she, or they is excluded and ostracized from the group. Then, fifth, he, she, or they may be welcomed and included into deviant groups. Sixth, the person is treated differently in a negative way by those in normative society. And finally, he, she, or they internalizes the label and begins to think of themselves or any other circumstance as deviant. So think of himself, herself, themselves as deviant. Now recall from Social 101 that a master status is one that defines our primary identity. The status is the most dominant about a person. Some statuses are more relative to the situation you're in, but the master status tends to form the key identity across context is the intersections of whom we are, right? Hughes explains that auxiliary traits are preconceptions that people associate with the master status. So in this situation, when we talk about what Hughes is talking about, the master status, we take with preconceptions about a person's identity, we then fill in the blanks and the person and such create a deviant image, right? With this preconceived notion about a heroin addict, right? There might might be an example. A heroin addict may be the master status. And the idea about the heroin addict may be that they are them, so they are thieves who steal to get money for their fix, is an auxiliary trait that paints the picture of the deviant identity as a heroin addict, right? As we'll discuss later in this course, the rates at which middle-class white women are using heroin are increasing, which are related to the relativity of deviance. We might not traditionally think of middle-class white women at, with a family when we picture a heroin addict, so this would go against the preconception that we might hold. Lamert's deviance types rel relates to being labeled as deviant and developing a deviant identity. We can think of the types of deviance and stages of the deviant act, similar to Adler's seven definition all stages, right? So this becomes very important towards how we understand this. So now the first thing we might want to do here in talking about this is I'm switching to this slide to make sure we're on the right slide because I want to make sure I'm not misleading you here is that we start looking at what Lemert built upon Becker's idea, right? There is this concept of primary deviance is when a person commits a deviant act, but they are not labeled as such. Most people stay here, they avoid a deviant identity, but secondary deviance is when the person is labeled as a deviant for their behaviors and he, she, or they accepts the identity. Tertiary, de tertiary deviance, in addition to primary and secondary, where a smaller subset of people end up embracing the deviant identity by strongly identifying with the label, is important to remember that deviant identity is created through a progression of stages, a career, if you will. Right, so this is that definition on the bottom here, tertiary deviance, if you didn't know how to say it. So, <clears throat> stages career, if you will. To avoid negative consequences of deviant labels, people use techniques to normalize their behavior, to motivate, to talk, to provide normalcy by explaining, excusing. Our actions takes many forms. Justifications, excuses, and disclaimers are used. Sykes and Matza discuss five techniques used to rationalize deviant behavior. So let me switch to slides so we can talk about those. So Sykes and Matza talk about this idea of how we may use these cultural abilities to kind of see our abilities of neutralizing it so we don't hold as much stigma in this circumstance, right? So they discuss the five techniques used to rationalize deep behavior. Denial of responsibility refers to the acts beyond one's control. I couldn't help it. Denial of injury, no harm, no foul. Denial of the victim. There is no specific victim such as the company is so big. I don't eat the rich, right? 
No one is even in charge of reporting the miss, missing office supplies. So there's nothing wrong with me taking them, right? Or everyone's doing it, <laughs> applying to higher loyalties, right? <clears throat> the behavior is rationalized as serving a greater good. So breaking the norm of lesser significance to fulfill a higher purpose, I stole the bread so I could, so the kids wouldn't go hungry, condemning the condemners. I am not the problem. You're the problem. Hi, it's me. I'm the problem. It's me. If you're being realistic here, right? Because you are doing something, but you're blaming others for it. And Scott and Lyman uh, say that the accounts can be seen as excuses or justifications, right? It must be exhausting rooting for the anti-hero. That's right. I got two Taylor Swift and one thing. Respect. But this idea of Scott and Lyman's is even interesting because it takes it further, right? So as stated before, they said these accounts can be seen as excuses or justifications. So rather than the techniques to neutralize the situation, excuses are used to distance oneself from the blame, even though the person accepts fault for the deviant behavior. These excuses include, and I, and I quote, appeals to accidents. I accidentally spilled the water all over my computer and uh, I lost my homework. My dog ate it, right? Yeah, appeals to accidents, right? Appeals to defeat the feasibility, right? I thought my roommate was turning in my work for me. So I, I just, I didn't think about it, right? Like, oh, they were supposed to do it. Uh, appeals to biological drives. Boys will be boys. Um, problematic, toxic masculinity, not a good idea, but people do this, right? Oh, Jeff hit him because, you know, boys will be boys, terrible. And then lastly, scapegoating. My roommates borrowed my book and uh, I couldn't get it back in time to do my work. So it's my roommate's fault. You made a scapegoat out of your roommate because you thought that would justify your circumstance, right? Justifications are used when accepting responsibility, but the person tries to legitimate the act as necessary. Sad tales, right? I didn't, I did it because that's the way I grew up, right? Like it's what I know. I didn't know another way. This is another way of looking at this. And then there's self-fulfillment. I did it so I can be a better person. It's not that I wanted to, but I had to make this change. So Hute and Stokes look at how people make verbal explanations before they commit a deviant act as a way to minimize the act in the future, which they call disclaimers. So let me get you over there to where we talk about disclaimers, right? All right. So we're looking at the idea of disclaimers. So when we think about this, Verbal, verbal explanations before they commit a deviant act is a way to minimize that future impact, right? There are a few different types of disclaimers that theorists recognize. Hedging is creating a sense of uncertainty about what a person is going to do. I'm not sure this will work, but, right? So you're setting up that limitation. Credential, um, credentializing, or sorry, credential relating can't say the word today, I apologize. It's giving a purpose or legitimacy to what they will do. I'm not prejudiced, but that's a great example, right? So when you're doing it this way, sin licenses are when the person suggests the rules should be suspended. I know you think this is wrong, but so you're setting up that expectation, right? And then we have cognitive disclaimers are when the person tries to make sense of something that does not make sense. That's an interesting phrasing. So credentialing is another thing that I kind of want to re go back to because I said it wrong properly, but it is something that's important, right? Credentializing or credentializing. Credentialing is really a big deal, right? That gives a purpose. But I wanted to restate that because I had pronunciated it incorrectly and I wanted to make sure that you had an understanding of what I meant. So moving forward, we've just talked about the cognitive disclaimers. We've talked about the idea of this, but essentially there's another one that works here and that is tries to make sense of something that doesn't make sense, right? This may seem strange to you, but, right? So appeals for the suspension of judgment happens when a person deflects any impending negative consequences or remarks. Let me explain to you before you all get upset, right? Like I'm setting that foreground as an example for this. Once someone is labeled as deviant, they go through a process of accepting a new identity. It becomes a really important thing. So we have this idea of primary, it's said, but we don't hold to it. Secondary, it's said, we did, but we're forced to hold to it, right? We have this idea of stages to take on the identity. You start looking at these seven stages, and I kind of want to go back to that slide for you right here, because this is one of the most powerful things I talk about in the in-person is 
I, I challenge you to look through these stages and think about when you've gone through this. Have you been in a situation where you've been outed by somebody? Uh, changes an attitude based on an older interpretation. Your identity is now spoiled, so you don't know what to do with it, right? Excluded and ostracized because of the situation. Welcomed into a deviant group that you choose to be a part of a new clique, right? Treated negatively. Okay, so now that's impacting to you. And then you start internalizing that behavior. All of these things are amazing ways to look at the stages of how we see this. So the stages to take on various identities deviantially is super important. And various techniques to neutralize these behaviors is powerfully used on a regular basis. Because once someone, as I said, is labeled deviant, they go through the process of accepting these new identities as part of, as Hughes talks about, the master status. Several types of accounts may be used to justify, excuse, or neutralize the deviant acts when a person is caught in a norm-breaking situation. So have you done this before? Have you justified, neutralized, rationalized, preset, proscript, prescripts? What have you done so far? Prescribed your ideas? Think about this. It's powerful stuff to think about. And I'll see you in the next lecture. Take care.